All right, hello, my name is Leith. Uh, I'm the lead engineer of the learning experience team here at Coursera. So today we're gonna talk about what internationalization is uh, and how to do it on the front end. So IE 10 on the front end is about taking a static string in your UI and translating it with a function. At uh, Coursera, we typically name that function underscore T, so I'll refer to that uh, throughout the presentation. And it wraps up all the IE10N magic that you'd want to do and returns a translated string back, like, say, in Spanish. So throughout this talk, I'd like to convince all of you who think that IE10N might be a little bit difficult uh, that it's actually easier than you think. Um, and for those that actually think it's quite simple, uh, I'd like to convince you that it's actually a little harder than you think. Um, but that might be a bit confusing, so uh, what do I do when I typically am confused is that I think of two things, lunch and an analogy that may or may not decrease my confusion. So let's start out this way. Um, think of IETN as like a great tasting peanut butter jelly sandwich. It only takes a few ingredients and a quick lesson on how to put it all together. Things can get super sticky and messy at times, uh, but in the end it delivers immense value for its size. So whether you're working on a small open source project or a large application with lots of users, uh, IETN offers great potential to increase the community that you engage with and new users that you may not have considered originally. So consider this, Coursera is an online educational platform that offers courses from the top universities around the world. In many of our courses, half our learners are international and a growing number of university partners are actually teaching their courses in Chinese, Spanish, Hebrew, and many other languages. So by necessity, bringing IETN to our front end is essential to our success and maybe to many other projects as well. So the best thing about IETN and our efforts at Coursera is our translation community. These are not just users, but volunteers who contribute back their time and efforts and make our platform better for other users. Uh, consider them as a multiplier effect for the success of our project and your project as well. Another value I can just be shown by looking at the engagement patterns, um, in particular of Coursera, before and after we added uh, translations to our courses. Uh, during a, uh, a release of a set of courses uh, that we translated both the content, so the video content, and the UI, uh, we saw a 130% uh, increase in user engagement. So hopefully you're convinced and hungry, so let's talk about how we do this. First, you're gonna need the bread. This is what holds everything together. And that means you're going to need to know what language the user wants to read. Uh, luckily, the browser actually tells you this uh, language and a set of uh, preferences that the user has. The accept language request header that comes in on every uh, request uh, to your server contains a comma-separated list of language codes and the preference for the quality that that user would prefer. You can see this header highlighted in red above. Lastly, if you have logged in users, you actually want to take this preference and store it on your server. Um, this way you can give access to the preference of what language they're reading uh, your application in on like their accounts page. So that way they could change the language and make it separate from what their browsers are. We actually have lots of users who want to take courses in Chinese, but they're actually browsing in English for whatever reason. So let's add some glue to your sandwich. Once we know what language you speak, we actually need to wire up the strings uh, so you know what to read. Uh, that means we need to figure out how to store all these translations. Now, your IETN LEN library of choice is likely going to make these decisions for you, but let's walk through um, how to think about this anyways. They're all basically use some parsable format, like XML or JSON, and they map a language to a string ID, and then they map those to the actual strings that you're going to use in your interface. However, this is going to get messy really fast. If you plan on adding more languages, and there are a lot of languages out there, um, you're going to end up with one giant file and it's going to be crazy to have a lot of translators committing all at once. So you're going to want to break these translations to separate files. So your first step, you would think, let's break uh, one file for every language, um, as you can see in this directory listing of mine. But if you've got a large UI like Coursera, I recommend instead taking a step of abstraction even further and having language, instead of having language files, have language folders. Um, and each of those folders contains uh, a file um, to a part of your UI. So imagine files like homepage.json or accounts.json, aboutpage.json, and so on. In fact, our Coursera, these translations are large enough that we have multiple IETN folders throughout our project. That way we can keep these translations close to the views themselves um, in our own app structure. Great, so now let's add some sweet stuff. So now that you got the translations and you know uh, what are the strings that the users want, uh, you're going to need a function to bring these two pieces of information together. 
So it's time to pick an IATN library for your front end. There are many of them out there. Wikipedia, Airbnb, uh, many other open source developers have uh, some pretty trustworthy libraries uh, that you can choose. Uh, w you should definitely try out one of these above. These are pretty mature. Polyglot is the Airbnb one. At Coursera, however, we went decided to go with the Require.js IATN plugin. Uh, we've used many Require plugins in the past, and it worked really well with our architecture. Uh, just a brief on, briefer on Require.js, it's a popular library for allowing you to work with JavaScript in a modular way. Uh, there are two standards uh, that uh, you'll see on the front ends. There's a common JS standard, which is kind of what you, the pattern you see in Node.js and Browserify. Uh, and there's also AMD, Asynchronous Modular Dependency. Uh, this is what Require.js implements, and this is what we use. So you can see from above, Require is pretty straightforward. It allows you to avoid having your entire environment hanging off the global window object. And here we're just importing uh, different libraries and then you're able to use uh, those within your app. So as mentioned earlier, the first step that you're gonna take with your IATN library is to configure the language for your user. You're likely gonna parse the, uh, the header out um, or from the user model on the server side and then actually put that string in your, to your configuration. Uh, if you don't, uh, the Require.js plugin actually does it for you. Uh, but again, you want your users to kind of have that control. Uh, so here in this configuration, um, we're configuring the plugin and all of Require from now on um, to pick the Spanish translations. So Require actually has a very strong opinion, or Require.js IATN plugin has a strong opinion on the layout of your files. It is similar to what I talked about earlier, except instead of your IATN folders, you actually have folders called NLS. And there's also an additional JSON file which lists all the languages that you currently support, so it knows which ones you're not supporting right now. So here in this program, underscore t is simply a function that maps keys to the translated value. So it's like an object, but it's a function for your reference. Uh, so now the variable question uh, will contain the Spanish translation for the key pb type. There are some complexities to think about, however, and depending on your app, you may want to consider other libraries that are rolling your own. Polyglot is a, is a good one that um, takes a step uh, further. So for example, you might have a lot of sentences like these in your strings where part of the sentence is a variable, and that variable might also affect your plurality. So here the variables are 1, 3, 199, and uh, there's a question of whether layers should be plural or not. So one way in which we've seen other libraries make this work is to have a custom function that takes in your strings and gives it interpolation and pluralization powers. So to, for this example, you can see that we pass in num layers uh, and a call to a plural function under underscore t, which is now actually a, a returned object. At Coursera, we don't actually do this, but we have a customized require IATN and JS plugin that um, has uh, underscore T allowed to do interpolation, but we don't do pluralization. So congrats, we're now done making lunch. But are we ready to eat it yet? Almost. So now you got to do localization, or otherwise known as L10N. Um, you've got to localize your content, which means to actually get the strings uh, in your UI translated. So. You can first start out with Google Translate. It's much better than it was a few years ago, but it still has uh, a minute, much more to go, and I would not recommend using it for production. But it's great to get some sample strings in your application so you can start testing and seeing other languages appear in your application. So it's a great and cheap way to move forward very quickly. However, look to your own teammates for help. Uh, you may actually have some bilingual speakers. These are all the bilingual speakers on my team. Uh, it was quite surprising, and they were very helpful to get us off of the ground and running. But don't be afraid to see if you have a community of users that will actually want to help you. Hosting a community is a non-trivial effort, um, even for Coursera, and so we use TransFX to help us do that. They host translations, and they provide a UI for your community to engage with each other, and to add and edit your own translations. Um, at Coursera, we actually uh, go further and use TransFX APIs to upload and pull down these translations with each of our commits or at some time frequency on some server. So, if you're hosting an open source product, uh, TransFX is actually free, so you really have no excuse to see if you've got a community out there. Uh, Own Cloud is a, a great project that I use, and they use TransFX for, in this way. So, let's talk about what Coursera learned when it tried to take this information and pull it all together. So, first we did what all great companies do when you need to tackle something new. We found an intern. So, we crowned Victoria queen of ITN and had her translate one, of, one page or homepage into Chinese. She worked really hard, she double checked her translations, she dotted her I's and underscored all her T's, and she got a page that looks like this. Great. But as time went on, and very quickly, 
this page turned into this. As you can see, almost all the strings had been reverted back because the IE-T9 injections that she did uh, hadn't been maintained by other developers as they iterated on the UI. Uh, we thought about training all our developers on all the lessons that she's learned um, and to you know, provide a set of best practices and for them to underscore T all the strings in their UIs. Uh, however, we decided against that. Uh, it's not that we didn't think that our team could do it or that we couldn't teach them, uh, but instead we took a, back, took a step back to think about how much time there is in the world to do all the things that great developers do. So first, they need to remember to submit their code for reviews. They need to remember to review someone else's code and go through that iteration cycle. And they especially need to remember not to forget to eat lunch. And don't forget, they also have to know how to test all their code in all their browsers, including every single IE. And lastly, they got to stop uh, refreshing Hacker News so much. And now in today's world, uh, they have to check their code on multiple devices. So with all that, uh, do we actually want our developers uh, checking all the pages in all the different languages, ones that they, they don't even understand? Clearly, the answer is no. So uh, first, we decided to put all that responsibility in one man's hand. This is Yang. So we just said, well, we don't want all the developers to do it, so why don't you do it for us? Um, so we told him he was our IATN guy, and we wished him good luck. So Yang is very good at coding, uh, but he wasn't too happy with his task. So he, did, he decided to do what all good engineers do when they get a task, and they're not in love with it. They automate it. Automation is not an easy decision, and one should consider it carefully and be wary of this XKCD graph on what can happen when you venture off into the automation worlds. So Yang started doing out everything manually for our entire project just to get a sense of uh, what it takes, and then he ran his timing results through XKCD's automation table to ensure that he was making a good decision. So Yang made many decisions along the way for our team. So for example, he decided to move all the strings uh, into our HTML and out of our JS logic. So no strings in JS at, JS, uh, at all, or any of our views. Um, at Coursera, you can see that we actually use JTemplates to write our HTML, so we don't write HTML directly, but we compile it before we send it out to the client. Uh, uh, moving strings in, in this way um, just into your templates is a great idea overall, whether or not you use ITN. Um, strings just are a better fit in the UI itself and, and don't belong in the logic. Next, Yang wrapped all the strings in our Jade files with the underscore T function and then interpolated in Jade. You'll notice he also made a decision to avoid using string IDs. He's actually just passing in the strings themselves. Uh, he didn't want to come up with a, a key for every string in your UI. Uh, variable naming is very hard, and then doing that throughout the entire application is no fun. So instead, the string itself is just the string ID. This does have a lot of complications because you've got spaces and dots and lots of other weird punctuation uh, in your JSON. Uh, but it also has some advantages. Uh, for example, if we don't have the string translated yet, underscore T is just going to return the string itself. And so you can actually mix a bunch of languages and then upgrade over time as the translations come in. Next, Yang had to create all our NLS folders himself manually and also all our translation files and then modify our Jade pre-compilation tool in order to inject underscore T as an argument. So here, this is, uh, if, if you look, uh, so the Jade file will actually be near the bottom. And um, it is these pre-compiled files that we actually ship to the client. So we actually don't ship Jade. Uh, we pre-compile it and then ship out a function. Um, but inside, uh, he managed to pull in the actual translations and then pass in uh, lower down. It got cut off. He's passing in underscore T. So all of Jade will actually have access to uh, underscore T just for that particular view. So that was a lot of file creation on his part. So after he did all this, he swore that no other developer, including himself, would ever have to do the same again. And he created an open source, UD, on GitHub. UD is the name of a famous Jade emperor of ancient China, and it certainly rules all of our Jade files. So um, what UD does is very specific to Jade, uh, but I imagine that the same approach uh, can be taken for HTML, Mustache, JSX, or uh, any other way that you are templating your HTML. So let's walk through what it does. So all we do at Coursera now is just what we did before. We write HTML and Jade just like always. There's no behavior change necessary in any part. Our strings are, are, are just as is. Um, it takes it, and then the steps that I walked you through before about what Yang did manually, it now does automatically. So all these strings will automatically be surrounded by the underscore T interpolation. 
Um, and the pre-compilation phase uh, through another automation tool that he wrote is actually inserting uh, those translations directly in. Um, so no developer does anything and we get uh, take advantage of all the translations. Um, the biggest component that's not in UDI is the uh, creating a translation file in an NLS folder uh, for every view. So if this folder uh, was called jobs.jade, uh, it would create an NLS file in there and create a jobs.json um, for those translations. And so that's how Coursera built its lunch and ate it too. Uh, but we've got a lot more to do. Uh, there are left-to-right languages and right-to-left languages, and they throw a big wrench in things if you only build one and not the other. German words are also very long, and they cause as much havoc as, a, as the uh, uh, change in direction of the languages. There's also a lot of performance improvements that, we can, that are needed for our non-English translations. We bundle up all our English and make those really quick, um, but for our international users um, through Acquire, we actually ship them out one at a time, and so um, there's some huge performance uh, tweaks that we need to do on our part. So we'll be happily sharing all these updates as we improve our own IT and infrastructure and as we learn more on our blog at tech.coursera.org. So please follow us. That's all I have for now is a quick talk. I uh, hope you had some fun and learned a bit along the way. And uh, thank you for all your time.